life can bring us storms. Those moments where we wander, wonder, doubt. The journey doesn't stop, but the progress does. It can be lonely, painful. Sometimes we try to stare it down, as if we could somehow will it to go away. Or we think we can go toe-to-toe and come out the other side, unscathed. We often forget just how small we are. The truth is, storms are inevitable. But when they appear, we have a protector. A savior who knows a thing or two about calming storms. A God who is a stronghold in times of trouble. In our weakness, He is strong. In our fear, He is courage. In our desperation, He is peace. Yes, storms are inevitable. But our God is invincible. When I started to get serious about my relationship with God, it was during my college uh, time. And I've noticed something rather alarming. Uh, Many of my classmates from my college days that uh, were encouragement to me, they no longer are in ministry. And some of them actually are no longer walking with the Lord. And I wondered, I mean, how can a fire that once burned so uh, bright have been snuffed out in the lives of so many of us. I mean, it's happened for probably a number of different reasons. And I've gone through my life and uh, I've worked with people and talked with uh, so many people about their journey, their spiritual journeys. Some of the reasons, uh, often it's because life just became too difficult. And uh, it's just they couldn't handle certain things. Some gave up because they were discouraged with the church. And that, uh, that happens. There's a lot of that, and I hear more and more of that kind of thing. Some give up because someone um, close to them died, and they just could not handle in the grief process and the questions that that sometimes rears up. Some gave up because uh, their, their marriage crumbled. But the underlying misconception is that, that life is supposed to be easy, and, or at least very, at the very least, it's not supposed to be this hard, right? Uh, but there is nothing in the Bible that supports that idea. We don't find that in Scripture. In fact, the Bible teaches uh, pretty much the opposite. We live in a fallen world. And today, I would like to uh, just chat for a little bit as we uh, have kind of set aside a couple of weeks to talk about this piece and going through some of the things that that we may be be enduring right now. And today, I want to chat about getting through life with your faith intact during the storms, the storms of life that come. In the, in the first section of this uh, message, I just want to share with you uh, what you need to know about uh, every storm in life. And then uh, in the second section, I want to look at what we need to do about the storms in life. So first of all, what, what do all of us have in common when it comes to facing storms? Well, first of all, storms happen to everyone. They just happened to everyone. Uh, we we kind of shared that last week about uh, everybody here has needs. And uh, when we get to know people, and especially as we talked about one at a time, we realize as we, we get to know people that there are needs everywhere. Storms happen to everyone. On an intellectual level, we know this, don't we? We know it, and, and yet when we're hit by the storm, our, our first reaction is, this should not be happening to me. <laughs> I, I don't deserve this. Or, or whether, whether we deserve it or not, we all have to endure an occasional storm. None of us are strangers to rain. Jesus said in 
Matthew chapter 5, verse 45, he said, For, forgives his sunlight to both the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. We all experience storms. And for years, I tried to kind of defy this principle. Uh, I, I, I thought, well, maybe, maybe if I just get organized enough in life, I wouldn't have a storm, right? Anybody ever tried that one? Uh, <laughs> or or maybe, maybe if, if I just had enough income, that's a big one. If I just make enough money, or if I would just make a little bit more, or if I could just handle, get a handle on my relationships, or if I could get my schedule under control, there would be no more storms. Well, that's not how it works. <laughs> I'm sorry to say the rain falls on everyone. In some storms, they're a result of our sinfulness and our own bad decisions. But many storms are not. And the first thing to remember is that storms happen to everyone. And if your storms are a result of your bad behavior, well, clearly you need to do something. You need to change what you do. And if it's not your fault, then you need to accept the fact that storms happen to everyone. The rain falls on the righteous and the unrighteous, and nothing can change that. So that's a truth that we all need to realize. Secondly, sometimes, uh, as we talked about uh, last uh, Sunday, in the midst of the storm, God seems to be silent. In the midst of a storm, God sometimes seems silent. In Mark chapter 4, Jesus and his disciples, they were in a boat. They were crossing the Sea of Galilee, and, uh, and suddenly a, a large storm came up. And this wasn't just any storm. This was a huge storm. Matter of fact, the Bible calls it a furious squall. Uh, and so it was, it was a storm, and it began to rock the boat, and the waves were crashing against the, the, the vessel to the point that it almost capsized. And, the, and the, the disciples, they were convinced that they were going to die. They, they, they knew they were going to die. The wind was furious, and, and the disciples, they all panicked. And, and where was Jesus in the middle of the storm? Well, this is what we find in Mark chapter 4, verse 38. It says, Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. <laughs> he was sleeping on a cushion. I love how Mark interjects just the little, little things in there. And, I, and I, I, I'm trying to picture the cushion, uh, you know, back in this day. But it says Jesus was asleep in the stern on a cushion. He gives us those details. And, and I love that little detail that Mark adds. While they were facing uh, this fierce storm, he was sleeping on a cushion. And of course, I mean, we know how the story ends. <laughs> Jesus calmed the storm, and, and they made it safely to the other side of the sea. But that doesn't change the fact that in the midst of the storm, he seemed to be unaware of the crisis. Cold hard fact is that there will be times when it seems like God isn't paying attention. It just might feel like that. There are times when he is frustratingly silent. And during those times, as we talked about last Sunday, that's when you cling to your faith and not your feelings. Your faith and not your feelings. You know, when we uh, read how the disciples panicked in the midst of the storm, we tend to think, well, how foolish of them. I mean, come on. I mean, it, I, I mean why, why would they be afraid? Jesus was in the boat. He was there in the boat with, with them, and, and uh, he would take care of them. I mean, I think probably the same could be said about us, don't you? I mean, how foolish we are to be afraid during the storm when Jesus is here with us. And so don't we know that he will take care of us? And after all, he said in, in, in Hebrews, we learn chapter 13, verse 5, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So it may seem that, that God is unaware of the crisis in our lives, 
but we have his promise that he knows every detail and he is with us every step of the way. So don't base it on feelings, base it on faith. So those are a couple things about storms. When they come, everyone experiences them and sometimes it feels like God may be silent. So how, how then should we respond uh, when we face storms. Well, now, we, 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 when the storm begins to uh, uh, rear its ugly head, being in a storm forces us to walk the talk, doesn't it? I mean, it forces you and I to put our faith into action. And, and, and how do we do that? How do we put our faith into action during the storm? How do we walk and talk in the midst of a storm? So let's talk about that for a moment. If you have your Bibles, if you would turn to Psalm 107. Now, we could have chosen like <laughs> so many different Psalms, right? Uh, and I mean, there's so many that could have led us through this uh, process. And there's so, I I'm just going to give you a few thoughts from Psalm 107 uh, on dealing with storms in our lives. But there are so many others. And if you are going through a storm in your life, I want to encourage you uh, to go to the Psalms and to, and, and to ingest them and to, to allow God's word to speak to you through that. But in Psalm 107, there's some simple things that, that when storms uh, of life are raging that we can do and, and, and respond with. The first thing we got to do is we just need to cry out to God cry out to God. In his psalm, David describes uh, these merchants experiencing some kind of a storm uh, uh, at the sea, uh, kind of like the disciples had to experience back in, or, or over in Mark chapter 4. And so in Psalm 107, uh, he says, in, starting in verse 26, in their peril, in their peril, their courage melted away. Now that happens, doesn't it? When you're going through storms, your courage sometimes melts away. They reeled and they, they staggered like drunkards. They were at their wit's end. Anybody ever been at their wit's end? I mean, at, at, you just get to the bottom. And, and when the storm is so overwhelmingly destructive that you, that you just kind of run out of ideas. May, maybe you're there right now. I mean, maybe you've done everything you know to do in the and the marriage is still having issues. Maybe you've done everything you know to do and your children uh, continue to rebel. Maybe, uh, maybe you've done everything you know how to do and, and your health is still deteriorating. Maybe you've done everything you know how to do and your business is, is failing anyway. Well, if, if, if you can get up, you can decide, you know, this Christianity thing, it doesn't really work. After all, my life is falling apart and God seems to be asleep on a cushion. <laughs> Maybe we should just forget the whole thing. I've experienced that with people. But there's another option. You could do what the disciples did in Mark chapter 4. They went to where Jesus was, and they woke him up. And uh, in other places, uh, John pointed out to me, in, in other, other gospels, they were, it, it, it's a little more calm, you know. Here, the, it, Mark just says, teacher, don't you care if we drown? <laughs> I mean, we're about to die, uh, and you're asleep on a cushion, <laughs> right? I mean, it's not the most eloquent prayer. <laughs> that we find in scripture, but it certainly was effective. <laughs> it was effective uh, in, in the midst of your storm. Maybe you just, just need to cry out to God and say, God, don't you care? It, it, I'm going through this. It's okay. He can handle it. I mean, I know he can handle it because he's been asleep on a cushion during a fierce squall. <laughs> and so if you cry out to God, he can handle it. Listen to what David goes on and says in verse 28 in, in uh, Psalm 107. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper. 
and the waves of the sea were hushed. <laughs> you know, I hear people say, well, I tried it. It didn't work. I cried out to God. I cried out to God for help. Nothing happened. And my question always is, well, how long have you been doing it? <laughs> how long? How long have you cried out? For an hour? For a day? For a week? For weeks? For weeks? It could possibly take longer. You know, I have a situation in my life that I've been crying out to God for, um, for years. And I trust. I trust. The idea is to pray as long as it takes to get the answer. You know, sometimes I think uh, that we're not crying out to God with a holy submission. We're actually maybe sometimes trying to snap our fingers in a demanding way of our, with our bidding. You know, there is a difference. There is a difference. We need to cry out to him and surrender to his lordship in, in such a way that uh, shows our faith in him. Lord, you're in control of this storm and you're in control of my life and uh, I trust you for the results. <laughs> Here's the deal. This is the holy submission part. Ready? The results may not always be what you think that you want. But you can be sure that the results will always work out for good. Because God is good. He is good. Romans 8, 28. Ah, we, we know this verse. And we know that in all things, God works for the good to those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. All oh, the goodness of God. So in the midst of the storm, cry out to God. Cry out and, and keep crying out to him as long as you have breath. He will hear you and he'll bring you out of the distress. Which leads me to the next thing if we're going through the storm and, and how we should respond. We need to let God guide us, right? We need his guidance. There's an amazing principle in the Christian life that, that I've seen many people just forget including uh, ministers and pastors and preachers and teachers and theologians and leaders and people who have been believers for decades. Sometimes we forget. And I've forgotten it as well at times. The principle is this. If you ask for God's guidance, he will give it. You can say, God, I, I've completely messed things up. I've, I've screwed up. What can I do to get back on track? He'll guide you. He'll guide you. You can say, God, I've ruined my business and I've run it into the ground and, and I need to rebuild it. He'll guide you. You can say, God, my husband has abandoned me and, I, and I'm all alone and, and how can I make it on my own? He'll, he'll guide you. When you seek his guidance... When you seek his guidance, he guides you. And, and when you seek his direction, he gives direction. When we place our future in his hands, he'll take care of our future. Listen to what David wrote uh, in verse 30. I, lo I, lo I love this, this line. He, he wrote this. They were glad when it grew calm. I bet. <laughs> right? <laughs> when you're in that kind of thing and, and it kind of calms down, isn't that like, oh, right? Right? So they were glad when it grew calm and he guided them to their desired haven. <laughs> he guided them, he guided them to their desired haven. Their desired haven. Oh, that's a place that I want to go to, right? Uh, that, that, that place of peace, that, that, that place of security and, and hope, that place of comfort and, and, and rest. A place of joy and love and fulfillment. That's the desired haven. And he can get you there if you let him guide you. But you have to let him guide you, of course. The journey may take you uh, on a route that you wouldn't have chosen for yourself. 
there's that holy submission part, isn't it? It may uh, include some high winds and it may include some rain. But if you follow his leadership, he'll, he'll guide you to the desired haven. Let him guide you. You know, some of you may say, well, that's good advice, but how? I mean, how, how do you let God guide you? Well, listening, listening and learning to listen for his leadership of God, it, it's a lifelong process. But I'm convinced about 80% of the matter is all in the heart. If you want to make the right decision, he will reveal the right decision to you. He'll reveal it through his word, through speaking into your life, through other people. You know, I thought about this, and uh, last year we had uh, an Easter egg hunt at our house with our grandkids in the front yard. And uh, our, our list of, of grandkids keeps growing. <laughs> we keep grafting in some more, but that's okay. It, it's so beautiful. But we have a little guy, he's three, uh, and he, he is, oh man, he's such a joy. He's so, he's so fun. And uh, we, we hit eggs uh, all around, you know, in different places. And then everybody, you know, on the count of three, you know, that kind of thing. Well, he's three. He didn't quite get the concept that much. And so we're trying to help, you know, uh, he found a couple of, he got a couple of eggs for his little basket. And uh, then we would say, maybe behind that tree. Well, you know, he was done. <laughs> he, he was done. He, 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 did, he, he didn't want, uh, I, I got a matchbox car. I don't need an egg. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Right? Are you kidding me? Well, the other ones, they kind of enjoyed the hints. Okay. Oh, yeah, because you know what they knew? There's money in some of these eggs. <laughs> uh-huh. There was a treasure. Here's the deal. God's only going to guide you if you're willing to look for the egg. He's only going to guide us if we're willing to surrender and listen and to look for the egg. So how can you get there? How do you let him guide you? This is how God guides us. If we're looking for the egg, he'll show it to us. We need to be in his word. We need to be in prayer. We need to be with others in community. Having God guide you to your desired haven begins with turning your heart toward him. Open your eyes and look for the, his guidance. Open your ears, listen for his leading, open his word, and allow him to lead you in paths of righteousness. The third thing that we need to do uh, about the storm, we, we, we actually talked about last week as well, when God seems far away. We gotta remember to remember God's faithfulness. Remember to remember God's faithfulness. You know, I begin by saying that I've known some people uh, f over the years who have stopped walking with the Lord, and, and some were uh, in ministry, actually, and they experienced His power in their lives. And yet, for whatever reason, they chose to forget about God's prior faithfulness. When the storms of life uh, come, uh, they, they, they didn't remember God's provisions of the past, and therefore they didn't see any hope for the future. So they give up on the present. I think that's why God gives us communion. and That's why I love celebrating it every week. It's just a reminder of the goodness of God, of, of the sacrifice that he made and the love for me. Here's my challenge. Here's my challenge. If you are going through a storm right now, make an effort to remember all that God has done for you in the past. I mean, why not start a gratitude journal or something and, and recall them over and over? <laughs> David wrote in Psalm 77 that, uh, that, that John read for us when he was going through a trial. Why don't you listen to these words again? Has his unfailing love vanished forever? Has his promise failed for all time? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has he in anger 
withheld his con compassion? And then I thought, to this I will appeal. The years when the Most High stretched out his right hand, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will consider all of your works and meditate on your mighty deeds. <laughs> wow. Back to these guys who were... <laughs> in Psalm 107 led to uh, their desired haven. It says in verse 31 and 32, he says, let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his, his wonderful deeds for mankind. Let them exalt him in the assembly of the people and praise him in the council of the elders. What he's saying is once you get through the storm because he guides you, Talk about it. <laughs> Talk about it. Remember it. Sing praise to God. Tell everyone how good God has been to you. God will get you through the storm like he has done in the past. And when that happens, we need to remember to thank him. Even though storms happen to everyone, they do have a way of making you feel like you're the only one who has, it's ever happened to. They make it seem that, uh, that God has forgotten you, that he's asleep on a cushion in the stern of the boat. While you're overcome with a crisis. But regardless of how you feel, that isn't the case. That's not the case. He is with you. He will get you through it. Now is the time. Now is the time to cry out to God. Now is the time to let him know. Keep crying as long as you have breath. Seek him. Seek him. Now is the time to let him guide you. Turn your heart to him and, and anticipate his leadership as you walk through the storm. And now is the time to remember his faithfulness. Thank him for all he has done in the past and prepare even now to thank him for seeing you through this storm. And by the way, while you're thanking him for this storm, go ahead and thank him that he'll get you through the next one. Because <laughs> that's who God is. Listen, if you're facing a storm, he is right here with you. His presence. So cry out to him. Let him lead you and remember his faithfulness. Let's pray. Oh, Jesus. I know that I've experienced some storms in my life. And that, uh, <laughs> that if I didn't have you, I would have been overwhelmed. But I'm grateful that your presence and your peace that passes anybody else's understanding was my guide. And I thank you. I thank you for your faithfulness. Some of the things that I've walked through, they want, wouldn't be what I would have chosen. However, you get right down in the mess with us. And I know that you do care. And Lord, I pray today, I, I, know, I know that there are people in this room, that there are people listening uh, through the technology that we have that are experiencing storms. And you are a good God. So we appeal to you in your goodness. Hear our prayer, O oh Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.